One. One can be convinced that a man is a prophet of God and then choose to follow that prophet, whatever he says, based on that conviction. Events in Zina's life do not show her to be that type of person, however. She did not apply a single blanket spiritual confirmation to all her decisions. Instead, she sought individual confirmation for large decisions, of which the ceiling to Joseph was undoubtedly one. For instance, Zina reports that when she and Henry were courting, Joseph proposed to her on three separate occasions. On each occasion, she turned him down. Zina did this even though she had received a testimony of Joseph's prophetic call well before this time. Todd Compton points this testimony out. Zina accepted Joseph as a prophet whose words were infallible revelations direct from God. Her older brother, Dimmick, Smith's close associate, probably also encouraged her to marry the Mormon leader, so it is remarkable that while she was an impressionable 19-year-old, she would refuse his suit. In what could be an unwitting choice of words, Compton points out the basic quandary, and a distinction apparently lost on many authors, including him. If Zina truly did see Joseph's words as infallible revelations direct from God, why would she have refused his propositions when she was convinced he was a prophet? If Zina practiced plural marriage simply out of obedience to the prophet, then it makes no sense that she would have thrice turned down Joseph and instead married Henry. Indeed, Zina recounted in one of her autobiographies that when I heard that God had revealed the law of celestial marriage, that we would have the privilege of associating in family relationships in the worlds to come, I searched the scriptures and by humble prayer to my heavenly father, I obtained a testimony for myself that God had required that order to be established in his church. In her late life interview with John W. White of the RLDS Church, Zina was asked if she could provide the date of her marriage to Joseph. Her answer, while not germane to White's question, gave a glimpse into why, in retrospect, Zina had been sealed to Joseph. Question, can you give us the date of that marriage with Joseph Smith? Answer, no sir, I cannot. Not even the year? No, I do not remember. It was something too sacred to be talked about. It was more to me than life or death. I never breathed it for years. I will tell you the facts. I had dreams. I am no dreamer, but I had dreams that I could not account for. I know this is the work of the Lord. It was revealed to me even when young. Things were presented to my mind that I could not account for. When Joseph Smith revealed this order, celestial marriage, I knew what it meant. The Lord was preparing my mind to receive it. Zina's answer on this occasion is consistent with the view that she received revelation from God in the form of dreams, separate and distinct from her testimony of the prophet, that convinced her of the truthfulness of polygamy. Once received, Zina fearlessly acted on this revelation, consistent with her commitment to be obedient to her God. After the 1844 death of Joseph Smith, the saints in Nauvoo redoubled their efforts to complete the temple. Early on the morning of January 3rd, 1846, Henry and Zina received their washings, anointings, and endowments, being among the first company through the temple that day. A month later, they were back in the temple on February 2nd, 1846. On this day, Zina received her second anointing from Parley P. Pratt. But there is no record of such being done for Henry. The records, however, do indicate that sealings were performed that day that involved Zina. You can see a record of these sealings here on the, uh, on the overhead. Shortly before 6 p.m., Zina was sealed for time to Brigham Young as husband and wife. This was done in the presence of Zina's father and husband, as well as John D. Lee. This ceremony occurred only one week before leaving Nauvoo, and Zina was heavy with child at the time. Her second child, fathered by Henry Jacobs, would be born on the banks of the Cheriton River less than seven weeks later. The wording of these temple records is interesting. Note that in the first proxy sealing, Zina is referred to as Zina Diantha Huntington, and in the second is Zina Diantha Smith. What makes this interesting, of course, is that Zina had been married to Henry Jacobs for almost five years by this time. Even though Henry Jacobs is in the room, witnessing his wife being sealed to other men, recognition of Zina's marriage is not granted in the record and presumably not in the verbalization of the ordinances performed that day. Some authors point out that Brigham's marriage to Zina and seven other wives previously sealed to Joseph was a form of Leverite marriage. 
This is an Old Testament custom practiced largely by ancient Israelites in which the widow, Zina in this case, is offered the opportunity to be married to the brother, Brigham in this case, of her deceased husband, being Joseph. Such an offer was apparently requested by Joseph before his death. The words of Susa Young Gates are reported by Zina's biographers. We are told that the prophet Joseph requested the quorum to marry and take care of his widows, Zina's granddaughter would write, and in some cases Joseph Smith's plural wives were given their choice of the twelve as their husbands for time, to give them the full honor and protection of marriage with an apostle. Todd Compton reports that many of Smith's widows did marry members of the Twelve. Brigham married between seven and nine of them. Heber C. Kimball married approximately eleven. He then recounts that other members of the Twelve and other prominent church leaders married seven or more of Joseph's plural wives, plural widows. Leonard Arrington states that the reason for Brigham's marriages to Joseph's wives is not difficult to imagine, and then describes the practice of Leverite marriage in the Old Testament. There is evidence that the practice of Leverite marriage was an Old Testament custom that was part and parcel of the polygamy restored by Joseph Smith. As implemented in Nauvoo, it appears that if a faithful blood relative was not available to marry the widow, then a worthy church brother could act in his behalf. As in the Old Testament practice, children born into a Leverite relationship would belong to the original husband in the eternities. Such marriages were solely for the purpose of perpetuating the name of the deceased and not for the glory or honor of the living husband. There is one problem with the concept of Leverite marriage, particularly in the case of Zina. Henry was apparently a worthy church brother and already married to Zina. Could not his marriage to her have been viewed as fulfilling any Leverite law? Apparently not, if the, if the fact that Zina married Brigham is accepted as prima facie evidence to the contrary. Joseph had asked the Twelve to look after his plural wives, and Henry was not one of the Twelve. Further, when Zina was given the choice of which of the Twelve she would marry in Joseph's stead, she chose Brigham. While such a choice may be anathema to modern observers, it apparently is a choice made by Zina, accepted by Brigham, and approved by Henry. When Henry and Zina were forced out of Nauvoo a week later as part of the general exodus from the city, they left as husband and wife. They, along with thousands of other saints, endured extreme hardship as they traveled the plains of Iowa. During their travels on March 22, 1846, Henry Cheriton Jacobs was born on the banks of the Cheriton River about halfway across Iowa. Ahead of the main camps, advanced scouts selected the spots for Garden Grove and Mount Pisgah. Building on each camp started immediately after selection with immigrants starting to stream in daily. Henry and Zina arrived at Mount Pisgah within a day or two of site selection. When they arrived, Iowa was still a territory. This was essentially the frontier. It was literally the wild, wild west. Even though it was technically part of the Iowa territory, there was no organized government in the area. On May 21, 1846, William Huntington, Zina's father, was called to preside over the saints in Mount Pisgah for both temporal and spiritual affairs. This map that's on the overhead here shows it's an 1846 map of Iowa published in the same year that the saints traveled across the very bottom of the, sa uh, of the state right al along here. Mount Pisgah is where they settled is right in this area on the uh, banks of the Middle Fork of the Grand River. There is no doubt that the marriage of Henry and Zina dissolved in Mount Pisgah. It was here for a very short time, just a matter of days, that they last lived together. Some authors and most critics see the dissolution of Henry and Zina's marriage as a matter of imposing priesthood authority in the marital relationship, basing their conclusion, incorrectly I believe, on a singular report that Brigham Young either commanded Henry to leave or made the leaving easier by calling him on a mission. Today's commonly accepted story traces its roots to one first told by William Hall and later by T.B.H. Stenhouse. Fawn Brody recounted his history, a story in Hall's anti-Mormon book that Brigham forced Henry and Zina apart. This story was picked up and uncritically repeated a generation later by several other authors. Critics of the early saints have, often with glee, latched on to William Hall's story and used it as a prime example of ecclesiastical abuse, pitting a powerful Brigham Young against a penniless and ill Henry Jacobs with Zina as some sort of prize for the winner of their imagined contest. It is easy to understand how one might see things this way. It is certainly the way that William Hall portrayed the episode. 
He said, at a place called by the Mormons Pisgah in Iowa, as they were passing through to Council Bluffs, Brigham Young spoke in this wise in the hearing of hundreds. He said,